guys. Thank you. Welcome to Grace Presbyterian Church this morning. Uh, start off with some announcements. See what we get. <laughs> got him. Okay. First uh, Saturday of the month, we got our men's breakfast coming up this Saturday. So look forward to some good food and some good fellowship for the guys. And uh, is that starts at eight? Tom, is that eight o'clock? Okay. Yep. Okay. Eight a.m. on that. Uh, if you're interested in becoming a member of this church, uh, they're trying to gather a, a few people together for a new members class so you can learn about the church, what's going on here, and um, also the Presbyterian Church. So if you're interested in that, please contact Wayne Campbell. <coughs> oh, coffee and fellowship. So after our service, um, we have some refreshments outside, and we're going to celebrate some birthdays today. So after the service, please join us for a time of fellowship, and we have quite a few actually on there. Even my son's on there. Yeah. <laughs> my older son, too, in the end of the month. So, okay, let's celebrate some birthdays and just uh, celebrate life in general. So join us for that after the service. You got anything else? Okay. So, again, welcome. Um, I encourage you to uh, shake somebody's hand and greet somebody this morning. Good morning. My name is Crystal DeLue. Welcome to Grace Presbyterian Church. We're so glad that you came here today. And welcome to everyone online as well. Hear this call to worship. Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. 
He is the King of glory. As the word of God came to Jonah, the word of God comes to us. Go, despite your fears. Speak the truth of God. Love your neighbor and your enemy. Forgive as you have been forgiven. Receive grace upon grace, overflowing from the fullness of God. Let us pray. For the moments we hear your voice and harden our hearts, for the moments we run from your presence, for the moments we allow bitterness to take root, Christ Jesus, have mercy on us as sinners and forgive us. O oh God, you are our light and our salvation. Living in your presence, we have nothing to fear. Open our hearts to your word this day. As we hear the story of Jonah, make us ready to follow Jesus on whatever path he leads us. Cast aside our fears and doubts and teach us to trust wholly in you. With lowly reverence and adoring love, we acclaim your glory and sing your praise. For you have shown us your truth and love in Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen.
great start to this morning. I see Sue Bouchard has been busy up here, so you all can't see what I see here on the pulpit, but um, thank you for that. Appreciate that. So we're going to go into the offertory um, right now, and so just some instruction with that. We're not passing the plate in the sanctuary. There's some plates at the back of the, um, at, at the exit there. You can place that um, when you leave, and so we'll pray for those offerings right now. Lord, your graciousness is just unmatched in so many ways. We just uh, are grateful for how you sustain us in, in the uh, obvious and um, in the not so obvious ways, too. And we pray that uh, we would rejoice in that. And as a sign of that rejoice, too, that we would extend that graciousness to uh, those around us, not only to our church family, but um, to the community and to the world. So this morning, I pray for the what is received, um, the monetary part. Um, there's so much, too, that's received in the work of, of busy hands and, and people that are around the church. But we pray specifically for our offering this morning. We pray that uh, you would just extend that and just multiply that and use that in an uh, amazing way. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, welcome everybody who's here and those online too. So we just pray that uh, God's message will speak to us all this morning. Just wanted to uh, bring up one thing too. It's the beginning of Asian American heritage and Pacific Islander. And um, I just wanted to acknowledge that the Presbyterian Church has a great history in Korea. I got a chance to uh, travel there with uh, my daughter and uh, a good friend. And it's amazing when you fly into Incheon and then you make your way to, to old, the down uh, Seoul and the, the old city. And when you come across the top of the hill, and I remember it vividly, just to see, especially in an Asian country, all the church steeples and the crosses just as far as you could see across the valley. And just some, uh, what a faith tradition, you know. Uh, the Korean uh, culture has been one of the biggest sending communities um, as missionaries in, in the last, as far as I can remember, 30, 40 years now. And so uh, we just are grateful for that. And 
and for that heritage within the Presbyterian Church. So we need to acknowledge that this morning. So let us begin. I got some, uh, I, I hope everyone received, I, I don't have one myself, but um, <laughs> obviously. But uh, part of my sermon prep is always just to draw. It's part of a theological practice that I do. And so just in, in reading Jonah, it's a very pretty short book, um, four chapters. But uh, what you have is just that theological reflection this morning, too. But I'm going to use some different art right now. So let's see this first slide here. Good artist, I love this guy, Jean-Michael Biscay. And so he is uh, from Brooklyn, New York, and uh, he's of Haitian and um, Puerto Rican descent. And so he does a lot of images that involve, I would call this a self, um, I gotta stay close to this, sorry. So this is a, kind of a self-portrait. This, this piece is called Boy and, Do and Dog in a Johnny Pump. Is anybody here from New York and know what a Johnny Pump is? No, never heard that term? Well, it's slang for an open hydrant, open fire hydrant. So he's enjoying himself cooling down. You can see the warm colors on one side over here, and then the cool colors representing the water splashing on him. So he and his dog are enjoying uh, a little cool down in the warm uh, Brooklyn summer. Uh, this painting is actually huge, so it would be like, I'm a, I, the figure in the picture is probably about my size, and it just extends, um, it's, it's almost a whole wall, but um, this is his representation of that. Now we're going to do a little turn here, so if we could see the next one, okay, so there it is. This is actually in the Art Institute of Chicago right now, housed there, okay, the next one. This right here is a representation of that painting by an artist named Willie, an artist named Banksy. And so Banksy is a, a fairly famous graffiti artist. Um, now they have tamed it down a little bit and called a street artist to give it a little more uh, uh, decency, I guess. But um, so Jean-Michael, too, grew up in Brooklyn, and he started his um, career as a painter, as a graffiti artist. And his, his tag was uh, called SAMO. And that stands for same old, and I'm going to keep it church right there. Okay? So that was his tag. So when he would go around, around uh, that's what he would draw on walls and stuff like that too. But that's his beginning. And the same with Banksy. So Banksy has taken the image that John Michael uh, painted originally. And so Banksy put this in the cultural center at uh, the Barbican Center in London. So this is a, a, a walkway, a causeway, kind of around the, the center. So they show art there, they do theater, and uh, Banksy showed up one day and put this on the wall. So you can see right there where it's located. And um, Banksy's take on this one, he calls it something a little bit different. So Banksy entitled his piece, uh, Basquate Being Stopped and Frisked. Okay, you can see on the, on the previous one, those are uh, London police officers, um, making contact with him. And uh, graffiti is not always looked on as something um, of benefit, but it's, it's become quite a cultural thing. And so uh, it's a bit of satire, plain and simple. Okay? We're using stereotyped uh, characters to talk about society and culture. I mean, there's a lot of things, we, places we can go from here, uh, but I'll leave it at the graffiti place right now. <laughs> So, um, so the scripture we're going to look at, too, this morning is just that. The book of Jonah is, uh, we could read it as history, we, could, we can flatten it out, but I think when we don't read it with the author's intention of being uh, a satire, I think we miss a lot of what's being said in Jonah. And so the device Banksy uses quite often is just that, a lot of satire um, in his work, and if you ever have a chance to Google him, uh, you'll see quite a bit of it. So it's, e and it's, what I wanted to do too is create a little tension um, in, in this presentation as well to kind of set the stage for us. Like the mirror, as you walked in, I know you folks online can't see that, but there was a mirror 
at the back uh, in the north narthex there um, a mirror and on it was scribbled something well on that mirror is my tag I also love graffiti and so the little scrawl on there is is my name okay S K L Y that's my tag moniker okay so within that so I'm hoping this is making you uneasy as well so uh, that's part of, of what I do. So just to give us a definition of satire this morning here too, satire is a literary device, an artful ridicule of folly or vice as a means of exposing or correcting it. The subject of satire is generally human frailty, identifying a person um, as it manifests in people, their behaviors, their ideas, as well as uh, societal institutions and other creations. So satire uses tones of amusement, contempt, scorn, and indignation uh, towards a flawed subject in the hope of creating awareness and subsequent change. So God called Jonah, and God called Jonah to go speak to his enemies. And it, a lot of times it's easier um, to fear something because it creates this, um, to make somebody an enemy causes me not to engage them anymore. So when I declare some, somebody or something my enemy, the conversation usually stops. And that's with Jonah is in the same. We, we don't choose to engage it. And there's this very interesting and unique uh, part of Jonah as a prophet because usually the prophets in the Bible are ones that speak on God's behalf to God's people specifically. And Jonah is a little something different. Uh, Jonah doesn't say a lot, but he sure does a lot. So the focus of Jonah is usually on his actions. Um, he has interaction. He, he's on this downward trajectory. So he starts off in the city and goes down to the coast. And then he jumps on a ship running away from God, and he goes down into the hold of the ship. He has an altercation with the sailors who chuck him overboard in order to save those life, and he goes down into the sea. And while he's down in the sea, God decides to give this dude one more chance, and a big fish comes along and scoops him up and eats him and holds him inside the fish, and he's down further. And then God intervenes again. The whole time, God's with him, and so he starts his upward trajectory. So he's coming up from the depths. He actually comes up out of the fish onto the beach. And then he makes his way up to the city of Nineveh all the while. And then he watches after our scripture from the hillside way up top waiting for Nineveh to be destroyed. So there's just a lot of movement. Everything's going on. And it involves a lot of different characters. I mean, we're talking, uh, let's see, God. Sailors, fish, boats, um, a city that everyone hates, people that everyone hates within his culture, um, cows get thrown into the mix, and there's this bush that grows like in a hot second, and a worm. These are a lot of different characters in a very short story. So there's something going on here, and it's revealing in this, I think, something deep. Something about ourselves. This story captures our, our attention in a very unique way. And it's revealing something. So Jonah has attempted unsuccessfully, now set the stage right for our text this morning, attempted unsuccessfully to run away from God. That's the boat, the fish, that's the first part of it. And now Jonah's getting a second chance. This is the second call of Jonah. So he's on the beach, and um, this time he listens to God. And he starts, and make, starts to make his way towards Nineveh. And that's where our scripture comes in this morning. Let me pray. So teach us your way, Lord. Lead us on a level path. Teach us to follow your decrees, and then we will keep them to the end. Give us understanding, and we will keep your law and obey it with all of our hearts. 
through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So I'm going to read my um, scripture is always the common English Bible, but I'm going to read Jonah chapter 3. So here are these words from our Lord. The Lord's word came to Jonah a second time. Get up and go to Nineveh, that great city, and declare against it the proclamation that I am commanding you. And Jonah got up and went to Nineveh, according to the Lord's word. Now Nineveh indeed was an enormous city, a three days walk across. Jonah started into the city, walking one day. He cried out, just 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. And they proclaimed a fast and put on mourning clothes from the greatest of them to the least significant. When word of it reached the king of Nineveh, he got up from his throne, stripped himself of his robe, covered himself with mourning clothes, and sat in ashes. Then he announced, in Nineveh, by decree of the king and his officials, neither human nor animal, cattle nor flock will taste anything. No grazing, no drinking, water. Let human and animal alike put on mourning clothes and let them call upon the Lord forcefully and let all persons stop their evil behavior and the violence that's under their control. He thought, who knows? God may see this and turn from his wrath so that we might not perish. God saw what they were doing, and then he decreed their evil, and he had ceased, that they had ceased their evil behavior, so God stopped planning to destroy them, and he didn't do it anymore. Here's the proclamation. He went into the city, cried out, just 40 more days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. That's the extent of his sermon. If you were to read this sermon in Hebrew, it's only five words. And there's probably some of you in here going like, ooh, I wish that was the case today. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> hate, to, hate to bust that one up. And then what happens? These people change on a dime. Whatever he said, I mean, he didn't mention anything about what they needed to uh, turn around from. He didn't mention what was wrong that caused God to want to do this to them. He didn't say anything of what they needed to do after he gave this five-word sermon. And there's no mention of the person of God at all. So Jonah's sitting there probably going like, ooh, this is good. I'm giving him no detail, you know. And, and yet they hear the word of God through those five words. And he's going like, really? Really? I've come through all this to come to this and try to drop this five-word sermon, and now we're here. So some of you um, are going like, wow, that's incredible too. So this idea of overthrown, like I said, there's no mention of God. And no sooner had Jonah proclaimed this and things are starting to happen, and this this movement just sweeps through this huge city, through this enormous city, and reaches the king's ears. And the king's all on it, right on. Hey, this is what's going to happen now. I'm going to make these decrees. Um, we're going to be in a, in a period of mourning, and things are going to change. And God sees that. And what's always odd, too, is, is he gets the cows involved in this, too. I don't know what it looks like to put sackcloth and on a cow, but it says it, they did it in here, you know, satire, okay? But he gets everything involved, creation, the people, the city, everything is turning in a new direction. Everything is being turned upside down. So God saw what was going on, and he relented from his judgment and showed grace and mercy. Like all the chapters in, in the book of Jonah, God's word and God's action is the last. Chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4. It's got either God's word or God's action that finishes the chapter. And it's the same with ours. So God uses, I mean, think of all the people that Jonah's just run into so far. Sailors, 
You know, we all have these ideas. Every time I think of a sailor, I think of like Jack Sparrow, you know, these pirate guys, <laughs> you know, just doing their thing out on the sea. Questionable character. These guys turn to God. Then Jonah makes his way to Nineveh. There's this city where people are horrid, where they divide people, where they subjugate people, where they own people. And these people do a 182. Questionable characters change lives. A huge turn of events. Everything's being turned upside down in this story. The person who's supposed to be good, Jonah, I don't know. His, his character's a little bit in question now. Why is he not following God? Why doesn't he do what God says? He would rather die than go to Nineveh because these people are his enemy. So I bring us back to the satire because it, it manifests itself in our story in people's behaviors and the ideas and, and what is thought of certain people and certain societies. Stereotypes are turned upside down. Um, with good in this case. So the bad, the good in Jonah is looked at as the bad. The bad of the sailors and the, and the Ninevites are actually good. So the writer uses flawed characters, in our case Jonah, with the hope of creating a new awareness. So we know this to be true. The five-word sermon, um, in that... What came out of that is a Hebrew word called hafak. Kind of like <laughs> on the edge too, but that's what the Hebrew word is. Um, which means um, it's got a wide use in the Bible. So it, it ranges anywhere from um, overturning to overthrow. My version uses overthrown. Um, I think the NIV you use is uh, over, overturn maybe. Okay, to turn, to turn over, turn around, to change, and listen to this, to transform. To transform. We can, we can get to that. Okay? And I would say transformation did happen. God's plan was to overturn, overthrow Nineveh, and that's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened. Whether Jonah wanted it or not, God's will was done. But Jonah, he just doesn't give up that easy. Jonah is, is going to feud with God after this in chapter 4. He is going to almost curse God because he won't destroy these people. That he's waiting on the hillside going, oh, they're going to overturn again. They're going to go back to their evil way. Boom. God's going to take care of me. I'm going to wait for that moment. So there's another overthrow that jo Jonah is waiting for. And I would say, too, for us, I'm going to go back to the enemy now because Jonah fixates on his enemy. And I think we do, too. We, as Christians, no matter how we try to justify ourselves, we exclude. We might not hate somebody physically, but we exclude people. We make enemies with what we do and what we don't do, just like Jonah, just like Jonah. So there's, we put systems in place, we put um, laws and protections around, just like the Jews did to protect their law, protect their way of being. And all the time we miss what God is calling us to do. We get so fixated on process, on people, on, on just things that are there that we think to protect us that we miss for a long period of time what God is actually calling us to do. And we place those as our enemies. And so that's why we have this mirror. Because if you're reading the book of Jonah, the book of Jonah is meant to be a mirror. So when I read the book of Jonah, I believe is my enemy. Satire. But it's a big slap in the face. If I read this going like, ooh, Scott DeLue, what are you doing running away from God? Grace Church, what are you doing putting up barriers to bring people to the kingdom of God? You know, 
this speaks to not only me personally, I'll be the first one to acknowledge that, but it speaks to all of us as well when we read this. And this is not always something we want to hear. I mean, how many here, raise your hand if you have experienced God's grace and mercy. Oh my goodness. Some weeks it's almost daily in my case. You know? Jonah, he's a prophet of the Lord. He tried to run away from God. Who is right by Jonah through the whole story? It's God. God. God saves him. God brings him, uses this crazy fish story to bring him back to reality. He uses these crazy fish stories to bring Scott Ballou back to reality sometimes. He uses these crazy stories to push on things, to say, why is this your enemy? Why are these people your enemy? Why are you putting barriers up for me to extend my grace and mercy? We've walked through 40 days of Lent. We walked with Christ. We have seen his sacrifice on our behalf. We have seen the graciousness of an empty grave. Easter. And now we walk through this Easter tide, this 50 days from Easter to Pentecost, all just realizing God's amazing grace. It's grace, grace, mercy, mercy, mercy. But there's some people I really don't like. God's got something for you all here, okay? I don't know what that is. I really don't, but that's, God's got something for you all. And it doesn't involve ourselves. God's called everyone here. Everyone here. God has called. God has called this group as a body to make a difference. To do what? To extend the grace and mercy. That's all. That's all. If God could use a five-word sermon and change a people that are hated and despised, this kind of ministry, this kind of thing. Extend grace and mercy. It's so hard nowadays. My, my daughter, you know, it, it's been hard for her too when she, she goes to a place where, all the, where we talk about fear. You know, oh, we're being persecuted. They're, we're fearing this, you know, our Christianity. These people lived under the Assyrian domination. That's pretty harsh. Nobody has taken my family and sent them across the world never to be seen again. When we say, oh, times are, you know, times are changed, I think it's something that comes with age, that we start to just fear, oh, times change. It's the same thing. The times, the things we feared, the things they feared in Nineveh are the same things we fear today. But what is God calling us to do? If we say we're fearful in one hand and then, oh, don't be afraid. It's a mixed message. And so all we have to do is extend grace and mercy. That's a message that speaks. That's a message that goes like, wow. So if you have a picture with you, I would encourage you this week to take that picture with you. And see yourself in that story as well. To engage those people 
to maybe just write on there, who is my enemy right now? Keep it with you and see what God puts on your heart. Who's your enemy? Who is God calling you to show grace and mercy to? And we pray that crazy things like what happened to the Ninevites and the sailors will happen, because I think it will. Amen? Amen. Amen. So I'm going to go into a time of prayer here. I'm going to do the pastoral prayer, but I'm going to save the Lord's Prayer until after we um, take and celebrate communion. Okay, so let's pray. Almighty God, gracious and merciful Father, in the presence of our enemies, keep us humble. In the presence of all people, Lord, keep their needs in front of us that we can show compassion and caring. Give us faith in our praying and love in our serving, knowing that by your power, all may find a new balance in living, a new victory in adversity and transformation through your mercy, dear Lord. We pray for all unhappy lives, those who are bitter and resentful, feeling life has given them a raw deal, those who are sensitive to criticism and quick to take offense, and those who desire their own way. Wherever the inconvenience or cost, whether the inconvenience or cost to others. Call out the Jonah in us. Make your judgment and mercy for healing. We pray for those who are lonely, who are shy, maybe self conscious, that they find dear friends. Those who are nervous and timid, put them in the way of strangers who love them. May your presence inspire confidence and ensure companionship for these people. We pray for those who live with bitter regrets, for loving relationships brought to ruin, for opportunities freely given and just so badly abused, for the bitterness of defeat and for the betrayal at other hands, and for the failure in personal integrity. May your grace give new hope for those to find victory in the seeming midst of failure. We pray for the ill, those are, who are ill and in pain, weary of the day and fearful of each night. Grant healing to those through your Holy Spirit and just the touching of their dear bodies. Bless the company of this fellowship today and the fellowship in every land. Make us eager to hear your word and to worship fearlessly in the proclamation of the gospel and show passionate care to all. Bless our country, our leaders, bless our children, and grant us peace within our borders and grant this nation and other nations peace within theirs. Let us be a people of peace instead of a people of war, a people who have many enemies. Bless us, each one of us, yes, even our enemies today, and keep us ever mindful of the vastness of your grace and your mercy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Damn, sorry. Please rise.
to God's grace in your life. For sure. So God's grace and mercy. Don't we say that all are welcome here? All are welcome at this table. All. Enemies included. Well, sometimes I find myself wondering about that. Why am I an enemy? But hear these words. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Send your Holy Spirit upon us, we pray, that the bread which we break and the cup we bless, may, they be, may it be the communion of the body of Christ. Grant that, being joined together in him, we may attain to unity of faith, to grow up in all things into Christ our Lord. And as these grains are gathered from many fields into one loaf, and these grapes from many fields into one cup, grant, O Lord, that your whole church may soon be gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, come. Give a couple instructions here before we go. We have some gluten-free wafers as well. And so as we serve this meal, we'll serve you um, the bread, and you may take that yourself. And we ask you that um, you hold the cup until the very end. We'll take that together as well. So, and I would encourage you to, if you're online as well, to partake with us as well. Because this table is not just a physical table. It extends to wherever we are on Sunday. All is ready. So on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, broke it, and said, this is my body given for you. And in the same matter, when they were done eating, he took the cup, blessed it, and said, this is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. Every time you drink this cup and eat this bread, do this in remembrance of me.
another blessing, some special music.
So why don't you rise? So receive this blessing. So receive it. Put your hands out. <laughs> Take this one. God has fed us at his table. We have worshiped the Lord. Uh, we have experienced his grace and mercy. So hear this benediction now. I pray that the Lord would protect you through the wilderness and guide you through the storms and protect you wherever you go from here. Receive this blessing. In the name of Jesus Christ, go in peace. Thank you.